Shalom Aleichem, friends. We are exploring the Kutta Sikhis, volume 24, uh, the portion of Eike, a fantastic Sikha, where the Rebbe takes apart uh, three sources. Rambam, in his code of law, the Alta Rebbe in his Shulchan Aruch, in his code, and further the Alta Rebbe in another work called uh, Luach Birchas Hananin, the guide of, of, of the laws of blessings. And all three are saying the same thing. And yet we see the Alta Rebbe deviates from Rambam in some minutia, and then in his guide, he further deviates from his own code in some minutia. And the Rebbe says, this is going to look very petty. It's going to look very tiny. But the truth is an understanding two things. First of all, understanding the precision with which Rambam wrote his work and the Alta Rebbe, both are famous for the precision in language. Entire volumes are written on Rambam you know, from, from, from Minusha. And the Alter Rebbe's language is known as Lishene Hazav, his golden tongue. So yes, it makes sense to, to look into these Minusha and these differences. Plus, understand that the Alter Rebbe is, is based on Rambam. And, and to, to a great degree, he's quoting Rambam in this section. And yet he deviates. And then he quotes him again in his guide and deviates yet again. So it's not for naught. And it's worth studying. The Rebbe is going to teach us how to study Torah, how to study a Rambam, how to study Alta Rebbe, and look at the details. So let's jump right into it. So, Rambam has a header to every set of sections. The first, the header to the laws of Hilchas Brachas, the laws of blessings, is to bless Hashem after eating. That's the header. And then he starts chapter one. It's a biblical mitzvah to bless. After eating, and he quotes the verse, you shall eat, be satisfied, and bless Hashem, your Lord, Hashem Elokech. Now let's take a look at the code of the Alter Rebbe Shochan Aruch, and then we'll look at the guide of Berches Anenin, which he wrote into his Siddur. And nominally, they're saying the same exact thing. In the code, he says, a biblical mitzvah to bless Hashem after eating, you shall eat, be satisfied, and bless Hashem. And uh, incidentally, in the code, he adds that it's a rabbinic mitzvah also, to bless Hashem before eating. The Rambam has that also in a later law. And he quotes a verse here, to Hashem is the land and all therein. Hashem ha'aretz umeloya. This is a rabbinic mitzvah. The biblical mitzvah is only after you eat, right? You should eat and be satisfied and then you thank Hashem. Here is the mitzvah to bless before eating because everything belongs to God. And if you take any benefit from the world without first saying please, you are like uh, abusing, misappropriating holy consecrated objects. And therefore, in the verses, everything belongs to Hashem. There's all kinds of discussions why Hashem did not make that into a mitzvah and a totally rabbinic mitzvah. Some say it should be, Hashem wanted us to understand that on our own. If you have to thank Him when you're full, you certainly have to thank Him when you're, when, when you're hungry. A little seichel you have to have. Certain mitzvahs are, are, are not commanded. You have to have a little common sense. But whatever the reason might be, that is a biblical mitzvah, and it's mentioned here in the Alter Rebbe's code as well. And it's also in the guide, again, nominally the same thing. It's a biblical mitzvah to bless after eating. You shall eat, be satisfied, bless Hashem. And then the rabbinic mitzvah is also to bless before eating. And he quotes the same verse to Hashem, is the land and all therein, etc. Et so the Rebbe says, let's look at uh, some nuance. And to make it easy, I have bolded and underlined the nuances that the Rebbe is zeroing in on. So, in the Alter Rebbe's code, he says it's a mitzvah to bless Hashem. Notice that in his guide, he doesn't say it's a mitzvah to bless Hashem. He says it's a mitzvah to bless. Now, you may say you're being a nudnik, but why would he deviate? His guide is based on his code. Why does he drop that word? It's got to be a reason. It's got to be telling. It's got to be informing us on what the purpose of each of these works are. And then let's look at the Rambam, which is the source of everything. So in his chapter one, Rambam says it's a biblical mitzvah to bless after eating. He doesn't say the word Hashem. So that's also curious. However, you might say he does have it in the header, which is right before it. This is chapter one, law one. And the header says to bless Hashem after eating. So, so there's no need for him to repeat it. So the bottom line is both Rambam and the code do say explicitly that this mitzvah is to bless Hashem, whereas in the guide it just says to bless. 
Next nuance, Rambam says, when he quotes the verse, V'yachalta v'sabata, you eat and be satisfied and bless Hashem your Lord, Elokecha. That extension of, of Lord, Elokecha, is omitted both in the code and both in the guide. It just says, eat and be satisfied and bless Hashem. Third nuance, in the code, it says, in the code, it says, etc. at the end of that verse. You shall eat, be satisfied, and bless Hashem, etc. In Rambam, it doesn't say it. And in the guide, it doesn't say it. What's the thing with the etc.? And then we'll find something conversely, that in the additional conversation, which we find in the code and in the guide, we're not discussing that in Rambam, because that's not in this particular paragraph of Rambam. Um, the additional thing about the rabbinic mitzvah of blessing before eating, and uh, both the code and the guide quote the same verse, La Hashem Ha'aretzum Loya, which is the song of the day for Sunday, that the whole world belongs to Hashem. In the guide, he has the word etc. In the code, he does not. So we find like a reversal. The code is into the etc. thing, and the guide is not. So to sum it up at the bottom of the screen, there are four questions or points that we're going to try to understand. Number one, why do Rambam and the code mention to bless Hashem? The guide does not. And by the way, it's quite obvious, even in the guide, who you're blessing, because the verse that he quotes is, you should eat, be satisfied, and bless Hashem. So, so why is it there in the first two? Point question number two, observation number two is, why only in the code do we include the word etc. by the verse about the benching? Not in the other two. Question three, why both the code and the guide omit the word Lord while Rambam includes it? You shall bless Hashem Elokecha. Hashem, your Lord, which is normally the way we, we say it. Hashem Elokecha, you give him his first name and his last name. And Rambam makes a point to do that, and both the code and the guide do not do that. And it's a deviation from Rambam, which is nominally their source. And finally, point number four, why does the guide include the etc. regarding the blessing before eating and the code does not? And the Rebbe is going to teach us how to study Torah, how to look at a Rambam, how to look at the Alta Rebbe's Shulchan Aruch, how to look at the Alta Rebbe's guide in his sitter. And many of the same details are there. Understand each has a purpose, and therefore there will be nuances that are really important. So the Rebbe says, let's understand the purpose of each of these three works. Rambam and the Code of the Alter Rebbe, Shulchan Aruch, are both a scholarly compilation, a scholarly compendium of Jewish law. It's not just an instruction manual. It's a scholarly work. It's all complete. It's like an encyclopedic entry on the various laws. There's a difference between the Rambam and the Code, that the Rambam is all of Torah law, including laws that don't apply nowadays, like sacrifices, temple laws, and purity laws. Whereas in the Code of Jewish law, it's only relevant Torah law to nowadays. That's why you might say the Code of Jewish law has four books. Rambam has 14 books. Okay, because Rambam is giving us all of Torah knowledge. It's like studying the whole Talmud without all of the complications whereas the code is more a code of actual Jewish law nowadays. But the common denominator between the two is they are both the scholarly compendium. compendium. They're both the compilation of everything, of everything Jewish law. Whereas, conversely, the code, when Malta Rebbe writes a guide, he writes a guide and he puts it into his prayer book. He writes a guide. He doesn't write a guide about everything. He writes a guide up here about the laws of blessings. He writes a guide about how to wash hands. And there are other laws. If you take a look in the prayer book, there are laws how to do about the felon and sitzes and early in the morning what to do. There are entries, short entries or some longer entries that made it into the prayer book. Why did he do that? He should just refer you to the code of law. And the answer is because the author Rebbe put in his prayer book, this is not a scholarly compendium. A prayer book is not a scholarly work. A prayer book is a, a workbook of how to serve Hashem. You use it to daven. And you use it to, to, to guide you through Jewish life. 
prayer book includes the Haggadah, it includes the Kiddush, it includes Jewish life. It includes, you know, how to search for the Chametz, you know what I mean? So whatever made it into the sitter and the guides, including the guide in question here, the guide of the blessings, Birch HaSananin, this means it's an instruction manual. It's like when you buy a machine, you buy a, a computer or a laptop or whatever, it's going to have a 10-page booklet, how to use it. This is not everything there is to know about this computer. There's probably a book's written on it. This is the guide for the practical user. And that's the purpose of, uh, says that I'm, of the guide. So that's the first difference. The Rambam and the Code are scholarly compendiums, and therefore everything that they talk about in any section needs to be clear so that the scholar who will study all other sections will have clarity and won't have any questions from one to the other. It, it's got to be perfect. If you reference everything, each chapter and each verse and each law has to be correct. It's a scholarly work. It's got to be able to be cross-referenced and make sense and be correct. Whereas instruction manual doesn't have that need. It's just got to make sense right here and now. It's got to be telling me about this law, what to do. And if it does that, it's functional. Um, but then there's another difference between these three. The Rambam generally does not include reasons for the laws because he wants it to be as concise as possible, I guess. The Alta Rebbe deviated from Rambam and parenthetically also from the original code of law of Cairo. And he cited reasons. And it's explained clearly in the introduction written by his children that, uh, and that he cited reasons on purpose. One might say because it's a much later code and he wants to be able to allow us to use the code in order to apply to new applications of law. And the only way to really be able to do that is to know the reasons. But that's a clear state of difference between Rambam and the Alta Rebbe's code that he does give reasons wherever possible. He wants you to know the source and the reason of the mitzvah. What about the guide? So here it's Kumsi Kumsa. Remember, the guide is not the a full complete scholarly compendium of the, of the laws. It's just a guide, it's a manual, it's a to-do. You might say it's like a little map versus the atlas. However, here he will cite reasons when it's not just for scholarly purposes, but practical purposes. An example I'm gonna give is that if you look into the Alta Rebbe Sitter, when it says the page of Tzitzis or Tefillin, by Tefillin it gives you reasons. It says, why do we wear tefillin? To subjugate the mind and the heart to Hashem. This is not a reason just for informational sake. This is part of the application of how to do the mitzvah. When you do the mitzvah, it's important for you to meditate on the reason, because otherwise it's not done properly. So this is a, a case where the Alta Rebbe, in the guide, in the prayer book, will cite a reason, because the reason will give inspiration and passion for the mitzvah. It's a practical use. So the way I'm writing it is reasons are cited as needed, but they're not cited in the abstract just for sake of uh, presenting a complete work. No, that's not what that's about. So now that we know these introductions, let's attack the four questions. It's almost like Pesa. Question one, why do the Rambam and the Code mention uh, that the mitzvah is to bless Hashem and the guide does not? So, on a practical level, there's no need to say that you're blessing Hashem. It's obvious. Look at the guide. It says it's a mitzvah to bless after eating. As stated, you shall eat and be satisfied and bless Hashem. The verse says who you're blessing. However, in the code and in the Rambam, there's a scholarly reason to further clarify that the biblical mitzvah is to bless Hashem and not someone else. Who else might you be thinking of? Aha! There is a law, biblical, rabbinic in nature, that you're also supposed to give thanks and bless your host. It's derived from the extra word, uberachta, es Hashem, the es uh, from which we derive that it's also your host, but this does not become a biblical mitzvah. It's a derivation from the biblical language. It becomes a, a rabbinic law, if you will. And therefore, to clarify, and, and that law is going to be written in, later in Rambam and in the Code. So therefore, for the scholar to have full disclosure, 
Rambam and the Yalta Rebbe in his code make a statement. You should know the biblical mitzvah to bless Hashem. Because you're going to learn later on that it's also a mitzvah to bless your host. But don't confuse it with this. It's not the biblical mitzvah. It's also a law, but it doesn't go into the same level of, of a biblical mitzvah. So if you're writing a scholarly code, everything you say has to be precise, even when cross-referenced. The Rambam and the code add that word, Hashem. Whereas in the guide, there's no need to write it. It's a biblical mitzvah to bless after eating. And it's clear who you're blessing. It says it in the next line. And we're not talking to the scholar who's going to be cross-referencing and we're trying to make sure everything is concise, everything is precise. That's not the purpose of this. There's no need to add that. And you might say, it occurs to me, that he's actually therefore quoting Rambam straight out. He doesn't need to add the Hashem, which Rambam brings in the introduction. So that answers question one. So let's put it in so we have everything in front of us. By the time we finish this project, we have the whole story right in front of us. The answer would be indicating blessing of host, not biblical. That's a scholarly piece of information. So when Rambam and Kovar's a scholarly works, it gets included. In the guide, which is a practical instruction manual, it does not get in. Next, question two. Why only in the code does it include the word etc. by the verse on benching? You could look at all three, and only once do you see the word etc. Uh, by the verse on benching. You shall eat, be satisfied, and bless Hashem. Rambam doesn't include it, and the guy doesn't include it. <laughs> to the Rebbe, only the Rebbe is bothered and is able to give answers. So the Rebbe comes along and says, because there's something unique what does the word etc. allude to? It alludes to the extension of that verse, which is um, for the good land. You should eat and be satisfied and you should bless. Hashem the Lord your God. For the good land. The good land is the etc. And uh, uh, we know that that becomes the reason for the second and third blessing of the benching. This, the first blessing, we thank Hashem for food. That's derived directly from you eat and you satisfy and you bless Hashem. But when it says for the land, al ha'aretz, that's the second benching, second blessing of the benching, which is the blessing al ha'aretz for al ha'mazon. You bless Hashem for the land of Israel. Hatova, the good land, that's a reference to Jerusalem and the Holy Temple. What's really good, Jerusalem and the Holy Temple, and that becomes the reason for the third blessing of the bench. Parenthetically, the fourth blessing is not biblical, and therefore it's not hinted in this verse. It came later, it came after the, the salvation, after the destruction of Beta. we thank Hashem. It's a rabbinic in nature. That's why you'll see that the abbreviated Me'in Shalosh, the blessing of Allah Michya after pastas and wine and fruits with which the land of Israel is blessed only includes abbreviation of the first three blessings, food, land, and Jerusalem. It doesn't speak of, uh, of really of the fourth blessing uh, necessarily. So therefore, coming back here, why does the al Rebbe throw the etc. in? Remember, what's unique about his code? In contrast to Rambam, and also really in contrast to the guide, that he cites reasons. So he, he is alluding to the fact, by saying etc., he's giving you in advance the reason for the second and third blessing. He's doing it briefly, but he's alluding it to the scholar that it's in there. So that becomes the answer to question two. So let's put it in. Okay, alludes. Whoops. Alludes to. The words, etc. The word, etc. alludes to the good land, which is the reason for blessing two and three. As I mentioned, Hala Aretz Hatova, the blessing of Birchata Aretz, blessing two, Hatova, the good land, that's Jerusalem and the temple. Dal Rebbe in the code, which he includes reasons, puts the etc. Rambam doesn't give reasons, so there's no need for the etc. And the guy certainly doesn't really have to give reasons just for the sake of giving you the reasons. That's not what it's about. Question three. 
Why do both the code and the guide omit the word Lord while Rambam includes it? So why Rambam includes it? The Rebbe struggles with it. And in the footnote, the Rebbe says we should take a look. There may be other versions of Rambam. But let's assume that Rambam included the word Lord. You might say, why not? He includes the full verse. When you say Hashem's name, you know, I said jokingly before, you say his first and last name. It's not unusual to say uh, Hashem Elokecha. Why should you drop it? However, in the code and in the guide, it is dropped on purpose. Because both the code and the guide do cite reasons. The code nominally cites reasons almost always. And the guide cites reasons when said reason is needed to give you the theme of the mitzvah and therefore the mood of the mitzvah when the reason is almost a practical need to know how to do the mitzvah. When we say Elokecha, the name Elokim is the name of judgment. The Rebbe cites a Talmudic source which says that we're supposed to thank God for the good as for the bad. And where does the source come that you're supposed to thank God for the bad? It comes from the word, from this word, Elokecha. Thank God, your Lord, your judge. Elokim means judge, judgment, strength. Givura. The Rebbe cites a Tosefta. Classic. Talmudic source that says that from that word, this extra word that the Rambam quotes and the Alter Rebbe omits, from that word we derive the concept that we have to thank Hashem for the goodness and for the judgment, God forbid, when it comes our way, that should never happen to anybody. Why would the Alter Rebbe quote it in his code? His code gives mitzvahs with reasons. The reason for this mitzvah is to thank Hashem out of gratitude, not out of faith that I'm accepting the good with the bad. So if we included the, the, the name of Elohim of judgment, it's antithetical to his purpose here, which is to give the mitzvah with reasons. You want to know why you thank Hashem when you do, when you eat? Because it says you should eat and be satisfied and bless Hashem. Hashem is the name of compassion. You, have comp you feel compassion, you feel gratitude, you feel abundance, you thank Hashem. That's the reason for this mitzvah. That's the mood of this mitzvah. The same thing in the guide. Here, the reason, the reason uh, uh, should be cited in a sense because this is setting the tone of the mitzvah. What's the mood of a person who's benching? It's not the mood of a person who's just filled with faith and he's thanking God no matter if something great happens or something terrible happens. That's part of Judaism too. There's a place for that. That's not the theme of benching. That's not the reason for this mitzvah. This is to thank Hashem for obvious goodness. And therefore, in both of these works, he drops the halukecha. Whereas Rambam, who's not into giving reasons, just cites the verse. Fantastic stuff. So let's put it in here. Or denotes judgment which is contrary to reason of this mitzvah. How great is this? Finally, question four, why does the guide include the word etc. regarding the blessings before eating? Here it gets interesting. We just said that the code adds etc. and the guide doesn't by the earlier blessing, and here it's reversed. It seems to us that the code is, is more comprehensive. And here, though, there's an addition of the guide versus the code. So the Rebbe says that even though normally the code would be more comprehensive and therefore more detailed than the guide, the guide is only detailed telling you what to do right now, there's an occasion when it makes sense to reverse that. And it is an occasion to be more detail-oriented when you're talking about a practical instruction manual versus a code. And that is when you're saying something that's pretty obvious to the scholar, but it can be mistaken on the practical behavioral level. And let's talk about this case. The rabbinical, this section is talking about the rabbinical blessing before eating. And it's based on a verse, La Hashem Aritzum Loya, who Hashem is the land and all they're in. Now, normally that verse, if you look at Rashi on that verse, other commentaries, it's referring to the land of Israel. When it says in Torah, the land, it refers to the land of Israel. 
The land belongs to Hashem. So therefore, for a Jew, living, you know, in proper days when a Jew should be living in Israel, and it's the land of the Jews that belongs to a Jew, he has to bless Hashem because it's Hashem's. The land belongs to Hashem. What about if I'm living in the diaspora? What if I was given food by a Gentile? You know, Gentiles don't have the same laws as Jews. You know, Gentiles' food doesn't have to be tithed. I don't know. There's all kinds of different laws. Jewish food has different laws than Gentile. So one might say, the scholar is not going to say this because it's quite obvious. So that for, in the code, it doesn't have to be pointed out. In the code, it just says the land belongs to Hashem, and not everyone understands you're a scholar. You understand that it means the whole world. But on the practical guide, this is how I'm understanding this. This is an instruction manual to every Jew. Not necessarily a person who knows how to study the code. He's reading the center. And he's about to eat something. And he's wondering, should he make a bracha? It's food that he got from a Gentile neighbor. So it's not necessarily included in the first half of that verse. Quote, to the land belongs Hashem. To Hashem belongs the land, referring to the land of Israel. Or the Jewish own stuff. Therefore, the Alter Rebbe adds the word etc. What's the rest of that verse? The entire world. I indicated it here. And therefore, just on a practical level, it's almost you have to add something which is quite obvious because you're not talking necessarily to a skull. So that becomes the answer to this question. Practical instruction to bless even diaspora and Gentile foods. How amazing is this? How amazing is this? The Rebbe is teaching us how to study a Rambam, how to study an Alta Rebbe, how to study a Birch an addendum, a guide that the Alta Rebbe put into the Siddur. How many of us read the Siddur and we Alta Rebbe throws in laws and we wonder why he's putting them in there and not other laws? The Rebbe shows us that he has an extra word in the Siddur that he doesn't have in the code and vice versa. It's precise for all of these reasons. So I like to give a takeaway. There is no takeaway. The Sikha does not provide a hero. I'm going to make a suggestion. Two quick suggestions. Number one is, because it's not unlike the Rebbe to encourage us to find a, a lesson. Number one is that um, when the Rebbe speaks about the idea of Elokecha, thanking Hashem, uh, the word Elokecha we said is to thank Hashem for bad things too. But the Rebbe in this Sikha says, while the Rambam quotes that, the Alta Rebbe omits it in both of his sources. He doesn't want us, when we're thanking Hashem for abundance, to, to, to keep in mind that we also have to thank him begrudgingly or non-begrudgingly for bad stuff. To me, this speaks volumes about the Rebbe's approach. And while it's true that it's basic Judaism, that we're supposed to thank Hashem for everything, because we have total faith, and even, God forbid, we're facing Nishdugedach, the worst thing in life, where it's not an obvious blessing at all. For the face of it, it's a, it's a curse. A yid is supposed to have the power to have faith and thank Hashem. That's true. However, the Rebbe taught us that as we're getting ready for Mashiach, we're ready for revealed goodness. And the Rebbe encouraged us to ask for revealed goodness and expect revealed goodness. When the Rebbe said, good, but sein good, think good, it will be good. The Rebbe clearly said, it's not that it's going to be good on some mystical level. It's going to be good that you have betach and trust that it's going to actually be good. And that's the Rebbe's theme, and I think in a big way the Rebbe is speaking to Hashem and actualizing it and creating it for the world in preparation for Mashiach, when the world is, everything's good. So that's what jumped off on the page to me. That, you know, in, 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 this, in the Alter Rebbe's sources, unlike the Rambam, which is quoting the verse, but the Alter Rebbe's sources, which is giving the theme and the reason of the mitzvahs, he omits that word. The Rebbe is, I think, giving us an allowance. If God forbid, somebody is expected to thank Hashem because they're faced with challenge and tragedy. The Rebbe is saying, I understand that it's not going to be with the same sense of gratitude, and I'm not expecting you to have that. Conversely, the Rebbe wants us to be able to have moments of gratitude with a full heart on a human level. Because that's what, what our generation is, and that's what Mashiach is that on a human level, we're going to experience all the truths. And therefore, on a human level, we're going to feel grat gratitude. Not just because it says so in the book and out of faith, because we're going to feel it. And therefore, don't mix in 
when you're saying you're benching and you're thanking Hashem for all your gifts, don't mix in the fact that even if things weren't so, you would also thank Hashem. Don't go there. And even if someone was given those challenges, but when there is blessings in their life, they should thank Hashem with full gratitude. Let's not mix the two, says the Rebbe. This is, this is my, this is a message that I took from the Sikha. And then there's another message, which is the more obvious message of the Sikha. The Rebbe wants us to understand that Judaism has two parts of Torah study, scholarly and practical. The guide and the codes. The same. You know, imagine a child is born an orphan, never met his father. And he finds out that his father is brilliant and kind and special and changed the world. So he wants to get to know his father. He's growing up. He's five, he's eight, he's 10, he's 12. So the first thing they tell him is, here's your father's guide for life. Live like this, you'll be living like your papa. But as he matures, he wants to know more. What, what was God, my, my dad's hobbies? I want to know how he thought. I want to know what he did with his, with his free time. How did he think? What was his whole approach? Then he gets another book, which introduces that. And that's what Hashem gave us. We haven't met him. He's our papa. We haven't met him yet. Hopefully very soon. So he gave us mitzvahs and he gave us Torah study. Torah study is not just to know what to do. There is Torah study to know what to do. That's in order to live according to the lifestyle that Papa gave us. And for that, you have to know practically today, it's the guide. For most of us, it's the abridged version of Code of Jewish Law. And to know the law is what to do. That's not really part of Torah study. That's more in the column of mitzvahs. There's a whole other area of Torah study for its own sake. Laws and a minutia and detail that we don't need to know for practical, including like we all study Rambam as Lababach Chassidim, which has with two thirds of Rambam or three quarters of Rambam, not practical to us. So what? It's Torah. It's Hashem's ideas. It's Papa's thoughts. It's his book. It's his hobby. You know, when you're doing mitzvahs, you're following your father's direction in how to live. When you're studying Torah, you're spending time with him. You're schmoozing. In the same way, every human being who's self-respecting wants to have a general knowledge about life in the world, even if it's not relevant to them necessarily per se. A Jew, a Yid, a Chassid, needs to have a general knowledge about Torah, not only what's relevant to me. What's relevant to me, of course, i got to know exactly what to do. It's really important. But as by any other moment of free time, the greatest mitzvah there is is Torah study for its own sake to know. And that's one of, to me, one of the great takeaways of this series.